Kai Rockies presents the continuing Catalyzing Innovation Series, Reinventing the National Power Grid with Dr. Peter Lilienthal. This edition sponsored by CXO Collective, creating breakthrough growth for businesses. Yeah, thank you. Wow, it's, uh, it's quite, well, thank you all for coming. It's quite something to listen to somebody else say those things about you. Um, but let me jump right into this, because we, we've got a, lot, a great panel, to, and, but I want to give this talk first, so I'm going to run through this pretty quickly, I think. Uh, he sort of described quite a bit of what NREL is all, uh, what Homer is all about, a spinoff from NREL. Most of this is already mentioned. We're very, inter only about a quarter of our work is here in North America, in the lower 48. So we, we do a lot in Alaska and islands, and, and just a, a curb to show how quickly, not just our business, but the whole field of microgrids is taking off. Uh, so what's the challenge? What are, what's the ch that we're trying to solve? And, and the problem is, is there's too many choices. There's so much new technology being developed. People are confused as to uh, what to um, do next. What, what should they do? And if you've ever been in sales, you know a confused mind says no. So our mission in life is to try to help people sort through um, what's best. Um, unfortunately, the answer to that question is that it depends. Um, it'd be nice if there was a cookie cutter Model T solution that you could just, one size fits all, that would, but that's just not the way it is. This, these technologies are very site specific, depending on the resources, depending on what the people need power for, and um, the technology keeps changing. It's improving, or prices are falling, to, uh, to, and, and so it's a moving target, and our job is to help people fit those pieces together. Um, just very simply, the software is an optimization software, and it looks at a wide range of conventional resources. I, I, the most common one is probably diesel reciprocating engines, but we can look at a wide range of them. We look at a w wide range of renewable resources with the recent price drops in solar photovoltaics. That's the most common one, but we do the software will look at wind, hydro, biomass, etc. Storage is sort of a, could be a silver bullet, but it's very expensive. So optimization is really important. There's a lot of new storage technologies under development. Uh, they're still kind of expensive. They're, they're still, like, most of them are still kind of pre-commercial, but it's an area where there's a, a lot of new stuff is about to happen. And load management is actually can do a lot of the same things storage can do at lower cost, but higher complexity. So uh, there's, it's just a lot uh, to fit together. Uh, that's what, that's our, our mission in life. So enough about us and our software. What's the problem? You know, what's wrong with the status quo? You turn on the lights and lights come on. Um, so I have to have the sort of obligatory polar bear picture. That's one problem that we have of, of global warming and climate change. But there's other problems as well. The grid is highly vulnerable. I've got this picture of an ice storm in Quebec that brought down those are very high voltage, very large transmission towers that came down. But they'll come down in tornadoes and hurricanes. We had Superstorm Sandy that really woke the Northeast is now in a panic about how do we make sure our critical infrastructure is functions in an emergency, that emergencies that might last for a couple of weeks or more. And the military obviously can't say, oh, there was a terrorist attack and, you know, we're on vacation for two weeks. So, so those issues are really important and, um, and they can't really be addressed through a centralized grid. The only way to, to guarantee that level of reliability is through power at the site. Um, there's also an issue, because we're, we're uh, back to the climate change issue, or, uh, if you will, renewable energy is coming on strong and that is a different kind of resource that needs to be integrated into the grid and that's new and different. So. Um, let me just talk about the grid for just a second, because I don't know if most people really appreciate just how complex and how large a machine it is. You open up a computer or a radio and you look at a circuit board, it's a bunch of components connected by wires. The whole continent is a bunch of components, buildings, connected by wires. You flip a switch here and some valve in British Columbia might have re reacted because of that, you flipping that switch. Or if there's a frequency disturbance in Louisiana, the identical frequency disturbance is happening in Maine at the same time. It's, it's, it's kind of an amazing thing that that even works at all. This is the only industry that has no warehouse. It, it, supply and demand have to be in balance instantaneously, always 
at the same time. So if a, and if a major unit goes down, a transmission line, or you know things break, power generators break, you know, it, um, the rest of the system has to pick up instantaneously. So it works. It's amazing that it works, um, and it's and it's quite complicated. So that's my little introduction to what's the challenge here. But then let me also talk about renewables for a second because uh, that's really my expertise, actually. Uh, like I said, I've been doing this for a long time. If I had known he was going to say something about hippies, I wouldn't have put that on the slide there. <laughs> but <laughs> I don't, I'm not sure I would call. <laughs> but, but I can, I do think there's, you can really look at what's happened in the renewable industry in these four phases. You know, back in the 70s and 80s and even early 90s, it wasn't taken seriously. It really was hippies and mad scientists. At, at, at NREL, there's some really brilliant people. Uh, but they're mostly like scientists, you know. Um, and it didn't really take off as an industry till there were some incentives around it. And, and so then it became all about how to maximize your tax benefits. And, and to some extent, that's still true. But we're moving into a period now where it's truly cost effective. And as soon as it's truly cost effective, it, things start happening really fast. Uh, and then the final stage is when, well, how do, we, how do we deal with renewables if they're a major source, not just a small source, but a major source of the power grid? So we focus on, right now, for the most part, on islands and remote areas where the economics is, is overwhelming. The, the, the alternative is diesel. They're pay, you know, I was just on the phone with the U.S. Virgin Islands pays 55 cents a kilowatt hour, and we pay 10 here. And that's true in every approximately the same story in every island and there's tens of thousands of inhabited islands in the world. So that's, the, they're the canary in the gold mine or whatever, they're the trailblazers for their move, um, because of, that's, they're already here where the real economics are pushing them to high penetrations, whereas the rest of us are over here where it's just starting to look like real economics. Uh, and so how do you deal with renewables when they're in high penetration? Uh, well, I, let, let, this is just illustrating the same point, actually. The price of solar photovoltaics, is, it's kind of amazing what's happened in the last three years. It's just truly plummeted. And meanwhile, the price of diesel fuel has increased s several fold. So the renewable industry talks about grid parity as, I don't know if you've ever, anyone recognize that phrase? It, yeah, they, when are we going to reach grid parity? And you can argue about, well, compared to gas, no, we're not there, coal, or, we're not there. And you know, it's a kind of a contentious discussion. If you're displacing diesel fuel, you're, you're there. It's absolutely cost effective now. Now there's no diesel, basically no oil used to produce electricity in the lower 48. But if you go outside of the lower 48, there's 200 villages in Alaska that are 100% dependent on diesel for their power. 300 in Canada, 3,000 in Russia actually, T several thousand in Indonesia, the Caribbean, Throughout the, there's hundreds and hundreds of islands in the Pacific, in the, in the Philippines. There's literally tens of thousands of places around the world that are dependent on oil for their power. Um, <clears throat> and that's five million barrels a day is something like 7% of global oil production goes to make electricity. So it's a huge opportunity. And in all of those places, renewables are cost effective today without subsidies, without incentives, uh, not at 100%. So you need a combination, you need a hybrid. Uh, but it's something like 50% or more. Um, hmm. uh, so, like this slide, because I, I do think there's, there's a problem, there's a couple of problems it, it, with this transition that needs to happen. And so I think people have been crying wolf. The um, utility industry has been crying wolf about, oh, solar and wind, they're variable, the grid can't handle it. Um, and that simply wasn't true 10 years ago because we were talking about all, all the renewable energy, renewable energy industry wanted to do was get something installed. At those levels of grid penetration, the variability doesn't matter. Now, when we're starting to get significant amounts of renewable penetration, their credibility is a little low because, it, and it actually is an issue that needs to be addressed. And a lot of people are just, you know, not folk, not taking that seriously. Likewise, I think the energy efficiency and renewable energy and ed environmental community has been crying wolf a little bit for decades. They've been saying there's so much potential for e to improve the efficiency with which we use energy uh, that we don't need new power plants. Um, and they've been saying that for decades. And meanwhile, the, the demand for power has continued to increase. So even though 
theoretically or technically that might be true. It, was, it, it actually wasn't turning out that way. Demand for power was increasing. And, but now, actually, demand for power is kind of flattened out. It's kind of leveled off. Um, and uh, so that's sort of like crying wolf, because uh, this issue uh, ha wasn't, isn't really, I don't think, being taken seriously enough. It has serious repercussions for the utility industry. Um, and those repercussions are often described as the utility death spiral. People like to over-dramatize things sometimes. I think that's overstating the case a little. But that's the term you often hear, that you've got all these fixed assets, you have all these fixed costs. If you're selling fewer and fewer kilowatt hours, uh, the, you, the price per kilowatt hour is going to go up. And then that's just going to accelerate this trend towards reducing demand. Uh, so death spiral is kind of a pretty strong way to describe that. but. That's the term people use. So we've got this coming train wreck. I won't let you watch this too many times. Twice, maybe. But um, I do think, OK, enough of that. I do think there is a coming train wreck where, because we've got these two industries that are sort of in denial about the need for change. And that this change is going to have to work its way through the regulatory system. So that's a slow process. And uh, it's got to start happening. So uh, we wrote a paper with the Rocky Mountain Institute, and I, and I think this term grid defection is another example of kind of over-dramatizing the, the issue. Uh, I, and, and part one came out in March. Part two is going to come out in a, about a month or two. Part two is going to be a little, we're going to step back a little bit from the term grid defection, because we really don't think it makes sense for people to cut the wire and go off grid. If you have, the, the grid is an amazingly valuable piece of infrastructure. We do a lot of work with places that don't have the ability to connect to a larger grid, like these islands in remote areas, and they pay a lot more for electricity. And if they had the opportunity to interconnect, they would. Uh, so the problem isn't really defection so much, but the, the, the next slide actually shows this problem, I think, more dramatically. Uh, this is called the duck graph. Does it look like a duck? <laughs> and it's, and it's uh, California in March and the top line is sort of where we're at today and that's the a typical load profile over the course of a day uh, but if you start adding a lot of solar which is happening rapidly in, in, in California the midday load is, is gonna fall now in the summer there's enough air conditioning it's less of a problem this is like springtime but but your conventional generators you can only back them down so far before they start having operational problems um, and that's kind of the limit for them. They're going, well, at that point, we don't know what we're going to do. The problem with renewables isn't what you do when the sun sets or the wind stops blowing. The, the problem is what do you do when you've got too much power, right? So uh, it's, not a, it's not an unsolvable problem. It's just a completely new problem that they aren't, aren't that we're not sure how to, they have, how to deal with it. Um, uh, but, you, but you can't turn the generator off because here, you're going to start to need to you're going to need that power again. So you can't turn it off. You can't turn it down. There's load management ways to solve this problem. Storage would solve the problem, but it's expensive. So that's the problem. It's not unsolvable, but it's a new problem. So one of the solutions, the solutions we focus on, are microgrids. Make everybody responsible. Not everybody, but people with a microgrid responsible for their own vari variation variability. Their own. Um, and if you're an island, you are in a microgrid. So that's where the learning's happening. And, and so what is a microgrid? It's, it's you've got loads, you've got generation, and you have the necessary controls to make it all work together and capable of standing on its own. Now, an island's always on its own, uh, but a military base it, it would typically not be on its own, but it would be capable of being on its own. And with this, with this te new technology, you have the ability to really empower customers consumers, <clears throat> they end up being active participants in the electricity market. And, you, and people that need super high reliability, a data center, let's say, can, can, can get that. I mean, they can do it now with backup power, but this is a, you know, another way to do it. People that want a, a, more renewables than the, than the grid has can do that. People that uh, want to experiment with new technology can do that. And so it's, it's a way of empowering consumers. Uh, Pike Research, or Navigant Research, excuse me, is estimating that this is going to grow to be a $20 billion, mar uh, $20 billion a year market within a few years, within five years or so. So, w 
Everybody talks about the smart grid. It's, it's, it's a fancy buzzword. Um, I live in Boulder, which is supposed to be the first smart grid city. Kind of a fiasco, frankly. Uh, and, the, and, and, and here's my view on it. Might be a little controversial, but I don't think the large utilities are, are the right, are going to be able to provide, uh, deliver that kind of innovation. They have really legitimate security obstacles and regulatory obstacles. But these small places that we work, these, uh, these Eskimo villages, literally, are already implementing these, th these smart grid technologies because they're moving to renewables really fast because of the price of oil, and they have to figure out how to manage that variability. So, you know, I was in a, 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 a tiny village in a remote part of Alaska, and they've got a system there where individual heaters and individual homes go up and down in real time through a wireless network. When the wind blows, more heat goes into, the, into these, their storage. They have bricks for storage heating. When the wind dies, the power goes down. They're balancing the load with a smart grid wireless network in an Eskimo village. And so that's where the innovation's really happening. And that's how we're gonna, that, and that's where the learning, et cetera, is, is, is actually happening, like I said. <coughs> so there's lots of different applications for microgrids. Um, and so I've kind of listed out a whole bunch of them here. Uh, the ones we really focus on are these ones here that are really about fuel savings, because that's, that's where the economics really hap are real today. Uh, you know, the military and the emergency services is another one. That, um, and the environmental driver, I, I don't really see it happening that as much currently, but I, I, in the long run, I, I do think that's uh, going to be an increased driver as time goes on. So I, what I have now, I don't know how we're doing for time. I'm just going to whip through just some pictures of examples that we've worked in. A lot of them are in Alaska. Um, in Chile, we've got one where they combine the wind with hydro, which is, there's some nice synergies there. The military is very, uh, as I've mentioned a few times, it's another military base. Um, and this one's really interesting because they run on 100% wind. No diesels operating at all. They've been doing it for 15 years simply by controlling loads. Now, it helps if you're in the middle of the Bering Sea, you have a heating load 12 months a year, so that heating happens to be the easiest load to control, but um, the same thing could be happening as well. This is, this is the tip of Alaska. From this point, whoops, well, whatever. It's sort of an interesting location. That's not the, but just to move on, because we've got this panel that we'd like to get to, just in conclusion, you know, I've dedicated my career to this idea of distributed renewables, and there's, and it's starting to happen now, and there's because there's real advantages in terms of reliability, the ability to handle lot renewables at high penetration, and the economics is starting to really come come into play. It's it's going to take decades. But this is a transition that doesn't happen overnight, and and it, and so whether it's one decade or three decades or six decades, it's going to take time, and it's going to happen in stages. And these hybrid systems are the stepping stone uh, to this to um, that transition.